All right, so um, I'm still I'm about to leave town, but I'll just do one last thing on this because it's amazing. Uh, source here. Let's see. Um, let's see the newness of the new world. Uh, Medea, I'm trying to find where I left off, I think, uh, somewhere around here, probably, so, um, so basically, this claim that, <coughs> that, uh, so the Medea prophecy, I think, was like, discovering the new world and then maybe starting a new age. I'm not sure. Uh, in ways <coughs> that paralleled and reinforced his connections to the Christian Messiah. Second, and on a national and political level, the Spanish attempted to use the Medea and other Roman imperial texts as justification for their own program of transatlantic conquest. While other nations, particularly England, rejected such evidence in order to advance their own territorial ambitions. Uh, so I'm not sure what that means. Finally, and most, and perhaps most importantly, those who saw the revelation of the new world as a definitive sign of God's grace or a post-classical scientific progress or both felt compelled to invalidate Seneca's prophecy and thereby uphold the idea of the of an enlightenment that had dispelled pagan darkness and revealed cosmological truth to the Christian world alone. Um, so, I'm not sure if that's like they're saying that the Spanish were the ones who were promoting Medea and then the English were actually against it. I'm not sure why the English would give a shit about. So yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Um, the New World debate, which commenced in the wake of Columbus's first voyage, uh, has hardly been resolved today. It is not uncommon, for example, to find arguments still advanced for a Celtic, Phoenician, or ancient Hebrew discovery, or for the idea of a visit to America by Christ or his apostles. Christ did go to the underworld, uh, you know, during the harrowing, you know, after he died, he goes to the underworld, he comes back. It's a whole thing. Even the evidence for Greco-Roman knowledge of the Americas has been a topic of scholarly debate within the past century. See, for example, the speech by George Rogers Howell to the Albany Institute, some pre-Columban being discoveries of America, uh, 1893, and more recently Barry Fell's Saga America, 1980. That's probably about the um, the Vikings. The recent discovery of what appeared to be Roman amphorae at the bottom of a Brazilian harbor has given new impetus to the discussion of ancient discovery theories. But the find has not yet been verified, and further research has been indefinitely postponed, of course. Uh, Louis Leroy's now famous correlation of the discovery of the New World and the invention of the printing press as the two accomplishments with which the Renaissance had completely superseded classical antiquity is a good illustration of this way of thinking. So that's the way of thinking of like, saying like, oh no, it has to be new because that way we can pretend that we're, you know, living in some glorious age that where we just discovered the earth was round for the first time, even though Plato knew it in 500 BC, but somehow our stupid ass has just figured it out. And, you know, that type of shit. Um, the first person, <clears throat> Seneca and the Columbus hero myth. The first person whom we know to have read Seneca's Medea verses as a forecast of the discovery of the new world 
was Christopher Columbus himself. <clears throat> and his reading forms the beginning of a long and important interpretive tradition. Columbus, <clears throat> as is now well known, came in the later years of his life to see himself as an emissary of God divinely appointed to open the gates to the new world and thereby to usher in a new millennium. In order to lend support to this view, he looked to ancient literature for prophecies of his feet and found them in the Bible and in Seneca's Medea, the latter having transformed, as we shall see, into a kind of Christian revelation. Columbus's efforts at situating his discoveries within the context of, of sacred and prophetic literature commenced right at the moment of his first contact with America, if we can believe the account of this event given by Peter Martyr. According to this early 1500 source, Columbus, after exploring the island of Cuba for some time, affirmed that he had found the island of Ophir, whither Solomon's ships sailed for gold. This Old Testament-based uh, identification later became a commonplace of Renaissance geography and gave rise to a vast body of critical debate. Even after convincing himself that the West Indies were merely a part of the Asian littoral, littoral or however you say that, moreover, Columbia, Columbus continued to look for sacred locales elsewhere, identifying South America, for example, as the seat of the earthly paradise. So that's correct, I believe, that South America was considered to be Eden and you know, the pinnacle of Eden and hell and, and uh, you know, a bunch of stuff, fairyland. Um, however, we shall not attempt to deal here with the much disputed question of what lands Columbus intended to find or later believed he had found. It is rather the significance attached to the fact of the discovery that, that concerns us. And in this context, Columbus's reading of Seneca as well as of the Bible are crucially important. The pairing of Seneca's Medea and the Bible may seem an unlikely one, but in fact Columbus demonstrates on several occasions his ability to read secular Latin texts in ways derived from scriptural exegesis. The Libro de las Prophecias 1501-3, for example, a collection of prophecies of discovery put together by Columbus, together with his son Diego and a Carthusian friar named Goricio, includes the following prefatory remarks concerning um, concerning the nature of prophetic speech and in particular its power to predict the end of the world. La Sacra Escritura testifica en el testamento viejo por boca de los profetas y en el nuevo por nuestro Redentor Jesucristo que es mundo de over fin los señales de cuando esto haya ser dicho Mateo y Marco y Lucas los profetas abundosamente también lo había habían predicado predicado all right, so as the sacred scripture testified in the testament, the way for something, the prophets or prophecies or prophets, I don't know, and in the something for new something, Jesus Christ, world uh, of something finish maybe the end of the world uh quando how quantity is uh something matthew mark luke uh prophets something also bird i don't know that means bird of avian i don't know predict 
and then prediction. Um, so whatever, somebody might know what that means all. A uh, horizontal line drawn across the top of this paragraph directs the reader to a note in Columbus's own hand. Seneca in uh, 7, Trajetide Mede in Coro Audax Nimium, Vernan Los Tardos Años del Mundo, uh, the late years of the world, or something, the later, the latter times, latter days. Uh, an elliptical note which seems to imply that the Medea II testifica que est mundo a de aver fin. So he's saying even the pagan, you know, even the pagans like uh, Seneca had the gift of prophecy, maybe. Uh, within the context in which Columbus here inserts it, that Senecan phrase, anis seres or tardis anios, does indeed take on scriptural overtones, functioning virtually as a Roman paraphrasis for the Christian apocalypse. Um, the apocalypse was in fact an event which Columbus felt his own discoveries had hastened. So that was back when the Christians understood that the apocalypse is the goal of Christianity. Whereas nowadays, I think that people think apocalypse is the worst possible thing to happen. So that's it's funny how modern a lot of modern Christians are the opposite of the original ones that way. Because the apocalypse was supposed to be the whole point to the bring about the new age. Um, event which... Columbus felt his own discoveries had hastened, as is clear throughout the Libro de las Profecias. Many in the biblical, of the biblical passages quoted there referred to the unification of the world's disparate lands, or the joining of East and West, the conditions which Columbus voyage, Columbus's voyages had brought about as harbingers of the end of days. Amid such passages, Columbus adduced the Medea passage a second time, in this case, quoting it in full and adding his own tendentious translation. Vernan uh, los taros años del mundo, ciertos tempos en los cuales el mar oceano So, I think he's talking about, he's quoting... Um, Medea here, tu la pastrera de las tierras, on the other side of the world. I don't know what all this, so I'm not going to try to. Columbus has not only again placed the Senecan verses against a background of biblical prophecy, as he has also subtly altered its sense. Um, as scholars have noted, Columbus changes the Latin plural novus orbis, into singular nuevo mundo, uh, seemingly to make the whole passage correlate better with his own achievement. Um, so I guess it said new worlds and then, or new planets or new orbs, and then he changed it to new world. Uh, and that might be the basis for why they called America the new world. Um, I was kind of quoting that, seemingly to make the whole passage correlate better with his own achievement. Columbus thereby expands the scriptural implications of his voyage to gigantic proportions, for the explorer foretold in the Medea now becomes a kind of new messiah whose discoveries would effectively single the end of the world, which is to mean the end of the age and the beginning of uh, God's kingdom. Uh, the full significance of this Christian eschatological reading um, of the Medea is in fact made explicit by Columbus in a further oblique reference to the Senecan text. In a 1503 letter dispatched from Jamaica to the king and queen of Spain, Columbus describes a dream vision which visited him in a moment of despair when his ships had run aground in the Rio Belen, and were under attack by enraged natives. Columbus, watching the grim scene from the crow's nest of a vessel anchored offshore, suddenly falls into a feverish sleep 
in which he hears a comforting voice address him as follows. Uh, so it's like servant of God, I guess, like Moses or David's servants. Uh, la, la. Could really use some fucking translations in this book, but whatever. <laughs> this heavenly voice not only portrays Columbus as a new Moses, the chosen vessel of God's will, but as the redemptive agent who has loosed the gates of ocean, a striking recollection of Seneca's vin Vincula Rerum, which are rendered as atamentos in Columbus's own Libro de las Profecias translation, but where Seneca had depicted ocean undoing its own bonds without human intermediaries, Columbus here casts himself as the keeper of the keys to those gates, perhaps in an attempt to juxtapose the Medea with the keys with keys of the kingdom passage from the New Testament. In thus using Medea verses to elevate his own stature and to create a link with biblical prophecies of the apocalypse, Columbus had the benefit of um, uh, benefit of a fortuitous and significant corruption in the Senecan text. In the A class of manuscripts, the group most widely employed by Renaissance editors, the name Typhus or whatever, is found in line 378, where modern editors have preferred the E-class reading Tethys. As a result, <coughs> the revealer of the Novus Orbis was identified with as Typhus, the legendary helmsman of the Argo, rather than Tethys, the female consort of the god Ocean. <laughs> this change held huge, huge implications for the Columbus myth, as we have already partly seen in the explorer's own Libra de las Profecias translation. Um, and then also I saw something here. <clears throat> um, Seneca and Humboldt. The most obvious biblical correlate for Columbus's imagery in this episode is Matthew, where Christ confers the keys of heaven on Peter. Uh, but um, but Columbus may also have had in mind the Book of Revelations, the text he became increasingly preoccupied with in later life. Here, the keys of the abyss, or pit of hell, are among the central symbols associated with the end of days. So he's saying that basically he understood that America is the Antipodes, it is hell, it is the abyss. Um, yeah. And... Uh, Columbus derived the passage... Not only a prediction of the prediction of new discoveries, but a celebration of the single heroic individual who would reveal them. Seneca's clearly negative portrayal of Tiphys throughout the Medea as the navigator who had brought an end to the Golden Age and who had died at sea as a punishment for impiety was seriously occluded, because Typhus's indomitable spirit would lead him to the new world, he could be seen as an audax nimium in a positive rather than pejorative sense. Um, <clears throat> nor was this all that the Tafis reading suggested. At another level, the idea of Columbus as a new Argonaut, a man of daring originality, who was at the same time modeled after heroes of the ancient past, reinforced a cyclical view of history which was immensely important to the Christian myths of his voyage. As the second coming of Tephis, that is, uh, Columbus provided a powerful an analog for the second coming of Christ. This link is never drawn explicitly by Columbus himself, but will become apparent as we turn to the writings of those who followed him and who helped further the myth of 
mythicization of his voyage. Um, all right. The eagerness with which Typh Typhus or Typhus or whatever is ad adopted as a classical correlate for both Christ and Columbus can be seen in one of the early Spanish chronicles of the New World, the Historia de las Indias of Friar Bar Bartolomeu de las Casas, 1535. <clears throat> in chapter 10 of this deeply religious work, Las Casas examined several ancient texts which had in his day <clears throat> been deemed prophecies of Columbus's discovery, including first and foremost Seneca's Medea, he quotes the familiar verses from the second chorus of this work with the Typhus variant in the penultimate line and comments. Blah, blah, blah. Motherfuckers. Examining Typhus as the equivalent of navigator, <clears throat> then Las Casas finds that what his Christian eschatology. I don't know how to say that, uh, requires a sign that Columbus's discovery had come to as the fulfillment of divine providence. Not content with this, however, he goes on to magnify Typhus's stature by adducing another also corrupted passage from the beginning of Medea. Uh, blah, 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 Typhon. Here again, the variant readings of, a manu of the A manuscript line help Las Casas inflate the Columbus hero myth in that in this version it is Typhus who is portrayed as the conqueror of the wave, Domitorum Freti, where better manuscripts give a phrase describing his ship, Domitorum Freti, Domitorum uh, M. Freta. For Las Casas, as for Columbus, the discovery of the Americas had come as the fulfillment of a divine plan, not in this case as a harbinger of the apocalypse, but as a means of bringing the world of Christ to the as yet unenlightened Indians, which would bring the apocalypse, because the apocalypse is not supposed to happen until everybody in the world has heard the word of Christ, but now they're interpreting that as planet. So, uh, Whereas the world was may have meant to only be Africa, Asia, and Europe. Now world is, you know, nowadays people use world to mean the whole planet. Um, and just as Columbus had done in the Libro de las Profecias, Las Casas attempts to buttress this view by assimilating the Medea verses to Christian prophecy. So it's funny, they're saying we're divinely appointed to... Uh, destroy and remake the culture of the 